wow, this is the stuff that I dreamed of doing, and I'm doing it. Guitar slinger Tony Grieve tells us why he left pop evil behind. I broke, I mean, something in me broke. On today's 700 Club. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this edition of the 700 Club. It's the blob that ate Washington. In six years, the interest on this monstrous debt is going to be more than the Defense Department. And one year after that, it'll be more than all the domestic programs of the federal government. It is going to consume the government. We'll talk about that later. But in the news was that horrible picture of a pilot from Jordan being burned alive in a cage by these monsters who call themselves the Islamic State in the Levant. Well, the government of Jordan sent a strong signal back to them, and they executed two terrorists after the brutal butchering of that uh, uh, pilot. The terrible thing was that they were holding out a negotiation as if the pilot was still alive, and we learned that the, the video was shot at least 30 days ago, and the pilot was already dead when the negotiations started. So they are deceitful, and nobody can trust them again. And so they had a pre-programmed, beautifully scripted execution mm. so the whole world could see in horror. Mm. Diabolical. Well, now the crisis in the Middle East could even get worse, with Jordan promising an earth-shaking response to the ISIS killers. Gary Lane has the story. An ambulance transports the bodies of two al-Qaeda terrorists executed at this prison. The Jordanian government made good on its pledge to kill the terrorist captives if the Islamic State harmed Air Force pilot Maoz al qasaspe It took the action after a gruesome video appeared on the internet this week, showing the caged Jordanian pilot being burned to death by ISIS militants. The video is too graphic for us to show you, but it sparked outrage and protests throughout the Jordanian kingdom. And this response from President Obama as he met with Jordanian King Abdullah at the White House Tuesday. It's just one more indication of the viciousness and uh, barbarity of this organization. ISIS militants captured Kasaspe after his plane went down during an airstrike in Syria last December. The Jordanians had hoped to exchange the pilot in a swap offered by ISIS. The Islamic State wanted to win the release of this female terrorist. But before the exchange could be arranged, the Jordanians demanded one big condition. We want to see a proof of life. But when that gruesome video of the pilot's death by incineration appeared on the internet, the Jordanians knew it was too late for a hostage swap. As a matter of fact, the pilot's death may have actually occurred a month ago, long before exchange talks began. The Jordanian pilot execution video came just days after ISIS released a video showing the beheading of a Japanese Christian journalist. At some point, this kind of act backfires on a group like ISIS. Yeah. The Jordanian government had promised to retaliate by delivering a strong, earth-shaking and decisive response to their pilot's murder. What isn't known at this time is if the execution of the two al-Qaeda terrorists is it, or a much greater response is yet to come. Gary Lane, CBN News. Thanks, Gary. The Jordanians have a very powerful military. They have a powerful air force. They have a powerful ground force. Uh, they're desert fighters uh, who are allied with the Hashemite kingdom uh, that uh, is the kingdom of Jordan, the ruling family. Uh, but there's a lot of unrest in Jordan. So the question is, how far can the king go before the Palestinians or some radical group decides they want to overthrow him? So uh, how much leeway he's got, we don't know. But I do think he's going to turn loose his air force to go after uh, ISIS. Well, our CBN News terrorism analyst, Eric Stackelbeck, is joining us now from Washington. And Eric, why would uh, a organization put out a video that's clearly going to inflame and, and uh, energize their enemies. Well, Pat, it's interesting because on one hand, this absolutely energizes ISIS's enemies. Look at Jordanians in the streets protesting against ISIS. But on the other hand, and this is tough to wrap our heads around, Pat, there are people around the world who see ISIS beheading people and, and setting people on fire, raping women and children. And Pat, they're not repelled by it they're actually drawn to it. I know it sounds crazy to people, but we have 
thousands and thousands of recruits from right here in the West who continue after all the beheading videos, after the burning video yesterday, they will continue to flock to the Islamic State. They are drawn to this kind of sadistic violence, especially here in the West. Pat, look, we've been raised on a culture here over the past several decades of violent movies, video games, torture, bloodshed, and everything we watch. It's almost people have become desensitized to it, and they see what ISIS is doing. They think it's a cool thing, all this blood, gore, violence, and conquest. But the main thing is ISIS is winning. They are expanding their territory, and success plus this gore and this sadistic violence breeds attraction to many, many radical Muslims around the world. Eric, uh, ISIS stands, as I understand, for Islamic State in Syria, and then ISIL stands for Islamic State in the Levant. Uh, do you think the president's ever going to call these people Islamic terrorists? No, I don't think he is, Pat. I think we're in for a rough ride over the next two years until President Obama leaves office in 2016. He refuses to make the connection between Islamic theology and Islamic terrorism. This group is called, this organization is called the Islamic State. That should tell you all you need to know. And look, Pat, you and I have discussed here in the history of Islam, there is a long history of conquest and jihad. President Obama doesn't seem to want to acknowledge that. And it's actually, at this point, Pat, it's actually, uh, the American people are not stupid. I mean, when he comes out again and again and say this has nothing to do with Islam, no Islamic connection whatsoever, the American people are kind of on to the game right now. They see what's going on. They see the litany of bloodshed and severed heads, and they're kind of making the connection, especially since 9-11, that something might be wrong here within Islam. Now, the, the great thing, Pat, would be if moderate Muslims who oppose jihad and Sharia would step up in large numbers and oppose this, but so far, sadly, we're not seeing that in any kind of major way. It looks like uh, I mentioned yesterday that uh, the president is uh, willing to allow use of the, some force in Iraq to uh, drive uh, the ISIS fighters out of Iraq, but he will not lift a finger about Syria. What, what do you have about that? Well, Pat, look, this is going to be the status quo until President Obama leaves office. He wants to confine this conflict against ISIS to Iraq. He does not want to expand it into Syria. And a major reason he does not want to expand it into Syria is because of the strong Iranian presence in that country. Let's remember, President Obama, as part of his legacy or what's left of it, wants to strike a grand bargain with Iran over its nuclear weapons program. So to get involved in any major kind of way in Syria is kind of stirring the hornet's nest with Iran. He doesn't want to do that. Basically, he wants to manage this thing, Pat, until he leaves office, leave it for the next president. But here's the problem. He wants to manage ISIS, but it's an unmanageable problem. This is a problem, Pat, and an enemy and a threat. Like the Germans in World War II and like the Japanese in World War II, a sadistic enemy that needs to be decisively destroyed and crushed. No half measures decisive victory. Stamping out this ISIS threat is the only thing that's going to work. And President Obama, other Western leaders don't seem to get that. Ironically enough, the one guy who does get it, Benjamin Netanyahu, has become the scorn of these Western leaders instead of embracing him in this fight against Islamic jihadists. Um, Eric, last question. Uh, the uh, Iranians are hardly our friends. Uh, what kind of a deal does he think he's going to make? The Iranians are trying to assert influence uh, in Iraq. Uh, they, of course, got their own country, and uh, they have got control of Hezbollah. Uh, <clears throat> they are threatening the whole Middle East, and he thinks he's going to make a grand bargain with them? Tell us about it. He apparently believes that, Pat. And look, the Iranians, and we're going to have more on this on the 700 Club coming up in the coming weeks. The Iranians now effectively control four Arab capitals, Beirut and Lebanon, Damascus and Syria, Baghdad and Iraq, and Sana'a in Yemen. The Iranians are expanding their influence around the region. By the way, they're increasingly encircling Israel. But President Obama believes that these are reasonable chaps and that he can strike a grand bargain with them over that Iranian nuclear weapons program. Basically, Pat, he seems willing and ready to basically hand the keys to the Middle East over to Iran while we evacuate. At the end of the day, Iran continues to be the world's number one state sponsor of terrorism. That has not changed. The Iranians are working with everyone from Hamas, Hezbollah, obviously, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, 
Iran has helped arm and fund. Iran is the head of the snake of the entire global jihadist problem. Yet we think that they are our friends. And I read a report, Pat, in Israeli media last week that apparently President Obama has agreed to some 80 percent of Iran's demands already in these nuclear talks. And by the way, for our audience, one of the main things the Iranians will not give up in these nuclear talks is their long-range ballistic missile program. And they are working right now on ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, Pat, that can reach the United States. But the Obama administration is not demanding that Iran give up that missile program. Eric, God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, somebody in America elected that man and elected him for a second term. And the question is, can we survive as a nation these next two years before we get him replaced? I know that sounds hard, but it's difficult. Now, look, Eric has a book coming out. He's a you know, prolific writer. And it's coming out on March the 9th. It's called ISIS Exposed. We'll be looking forward to it. And so, Eric, uh, we look forward to that book. And thank you for your commentator. Uh, well, uh, Jordan, you know, is right next to Syria. And it, it's next to Iraq. It, it's pretty tenuous, some of the waters. And while Jordan is cracking down on ISIS terrorists, others are still captive to what is called political correctness. We'll have that report later on today's show. But first, it looks like Great Britain is going to enter a, quote, brave new world. Now, get this. They're going to create babies who could have not one, not two, but three parents. <laughs> wow. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau. Here's John. Pat, British lawmakers have taken a step to approve a new technique meant to keep genetic diseases from being passed from mother to child. It's a process that allows babies to be created from the DNA of three people, two women and one baby. The technique involves an embryo to be altered before it's transferred into the mother, a move currently forbidden by British law. But it will only be used on a limited basis at first to babies who have a specific problem that could lead to diseases like muscular dystrophy, heart, kidney and liver failure, among other disorders. But opponents warn the DNA swapping technique isn't safe or ethical and could lead to designer babies. If Britain approves the move, the first baby with three biological parents could be born as early as next year. Pat, of course, that would still have to pass through the House of Lords. I don't know what the Lords are going to say about it, but it's outrageous. The problem is when we start tinkering around with these things, there are hidden attributes that are in the genes of people that the scientists haven't yet figured out. And uh, these are the genes that keep us from uh, having, uh, you know, strange maladies or being susceptible to various types of diseases. So we start making designer babies and we say, oops, we left out something that we didn't know was supposed to be in there in the mix. And oh, it's a, I mean, a horrible concept. Huxley wrote Brave New World, and this is a brave new world that I'm not sure I want to enter. John? Pat, some 20 people are dead in Taiwan after a Trans-Asia flight turned on its side midair, clipped an elevated highway, and careened into a shallow river. The turboprop plane was carrying 58 people. You can see the dramatic video clip here, taken from a car on Taiwan's National Freeway. Rescuers are searching in the river for the missing. More than half of the passengers were Chinese, traveling to the Taiwanese-controlled Kinmen Islands. A spokesman for TransAsia said the plane crashed just four minutes after takeoff and that the cause is unknown. While the Republican-controlled House of Representatives voted to repeal Obamacare again, it's the latest move in the GOP effort against the president's health care law, which passed by Democrats without a single Republican vote. The law remains unpopular in the polls, and the bill now goes to the Senate. But President Obama says he will veto any move to overturn his signature health care plan, the law faces a major Supreme Court challenge later this year. Well, the U.S. national debt now stands at $18 trillion, and it's projected to reach $25 trillion within a decade. And paying off the interest on that debt is likely to get very expensive in the years ahead. Right now, with low interest rates, the government spends $200 billion a year on interest payments. But the Wall Street Journal reports government forecasts show that those payments are going to shoot up reaching $800 billion a year by the end of this decade. That will be more than the defense budget and other important parts of the federal budget. 
And those payments, those interest payments, could go much higher in the years after that, meaning the national debt is going to become very expensive, and Pat, that could lead to higher taxes in the years ahead. Well, that's the least of our worries is higher taxes. It's going to cripple our economy. It will mean that uh, vital government services are not available. But ladies and gentlemen, the big uh, giant in the room, the gorilla, if you will, in the room is, is uh, uh, the so-called entitlements. And we've got a baby boom bump in our demographics that is moving through the thing, and the baby boomers are hitting 65 every year. Great numbers, great cohorts. And as they enter into retirement, they're going to draw down on their savings, and they're going to be looking to the government to pick up the tab. And the cost is going to be astronomical because health care for the aged is much, much higher than people in their 20s. And so the health care bill is going to go up astronomically. The, the bill for uh, retirement services and those who have not got any retirement at all except Social Security, it's going to be incredible. And they won't face it. People are scared of political fallout. And they won't face this thing head on. And unless they do, it's going to destroy our economy. And it's going to mean to, we'll be living in poverty. We'll be a third world country. It's not just higher taxes. It's going to be really serious stuff. And it's the result of profligacy. If somebody spends all their money and they go out and they get drunk and they buy, um, you know, expensive uh, cars and things like that, and they wind up broke, then they're in trouble. You know, those are story in the Bible about a prodigal son who wasted his living and riotous living. Well, that's what we've been doing. We've been wasting our resources. And uh, how you pay off 18 trillion, I don't know, but it's going to be not 18, it'll be 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. And the interest rates will be alarming. So please, let's do something about it while there's time. Wendy. All right, up next, dire predictions about where France is headed. Uh, I see civil war and I'm not a prophet, you know, it's obvious. Civil war, that's clear. Civil war, as terrible as it would be, if civil war is a wrong expression, there would be nothing civil about it. Stay tuned for a CBN News exclusive from Paris on French suicide. Well, welcome. You're watching The 700 Club, and we're so happy to have you with us today. Hope I'm not scaring you. I'm just telling you the way things are. <laughs> it's an interesting world we're living in, and we need to do a lot of praying about it. Islamic terrorists, by the way, killed 17 people in France last month. But did those attacks serve as a wake-up call, or is the government in France still asleep? Some people in France say their leaders are still hostages to political correctness. And they're even worried about the possibility of a civil war in France. Dale Herb brings us this shocking story from Paris. French Holocaust survivors at the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. These men and women who saw such terrible anti-Semitism as children must now, at the end of their lives, face a time when a lot of Europeans want to kill Jews again. France's Jews have felt like a target for a long time, and the killings here at the kosher supermarket have only confirmed their worst fears, and it will cause more of them to leave. Some have called the Charlie Hebdo and kosher supermarket killings France's 9-11. But America clearly changed after 9-11. It's not at all clear if France has changed. Yes, there have been arrests and more police and soldiers deployed. But political correctness is still so deeply rooted in France that speaking out too strongly against Muslim immigration and being labeled a racist can end a career. French commentator Eric Zemmour was fired last month for saying that Muslims should be deported to avoid chaos and civil war. Zemmour has written The French Suicide about how France is being destroyed. We had hoped to interview Zamor, but his publicist told us he was in hiding because of death threats. A protest march by this anti-Islamization group a week after the killings was banned by police. 
Even popular far-right leader Marina Le Pen has been tiptoeing around the subject of Islam. She's reportedly feuding with her foreign policy advisor, Emrick Choprada, who gave an exclusive interview to CBN News. Choprada angered Le Pen by saying France is at war with some Muslims and in danger from what he called a fifth column of one million radical Muslims in France. But the problem, which is maybe worse than this terrorist network is the sympathy from a large part of the Muslim population in France towards the jihad and towards the radical ideas. I do not say that all the Muslims are violent, but I say that uh, violence is rooted in Islam, Islam uh, holy texts. The world saw millions of Frenchmen pour into the streets to say, I am Charlie. It was a touching outpouring of support for free speech in the face of Muslim terror. But conservatives in France saw something else, hypocrisy. The same French leaders marching for free speech who have not allowed free speech critical of Islam. Except for a few Charlie Hebdo cartoons. The same French leaders whose policies have allowed Muslim extremism to flourish in France. We don't have the freedom to say that the ones who are demonstrating are the, are the ones responsible for what happened. French author, journalist and publisher Jean Robin says flatly the government brought on the attacks by being harder on critics of Islam than on Muslims. The people who are responsible for these attacks are the ones showing off now and demonstrating uh, for freedom of speech, which they crushed year after year. In fact, when I asked French writer Renaud Camus about the French government's commitment to free speech, he laughed. <laughs> the government defends free speech. No, the aim of the government in the last 40 years has been to impeach uh, free speech, to express itself on the main subject, which is a change of population which is totally banned from the media, which is what you are not allowed to say. Camus has been banned from French media because of his outspoken views on the risk from Islam. And the French government's unwillingness or inability to effectively deal with the problem of Muslim immigration and radicalism could help ensure that there are more attacks like the one on Charlie Hebdo and the kosher supermarket. The words on the lips of those we interview were civil war. Uh, I see civil war and I'm not a prophet, you know, it's obvious, it's Lebanon. Civil war, I mean civil war, that's clear. Civil war, as terrible as it would be, civil war is a wrong expression, there would be nothing civil about it. After what should have been a clear wake-up call for France, it's not at all clear that France will do what it takes to prevent the next attack. We have to fight very firmly, very strictly against the Islamization of the French society. There is an Islamization process, and uh, we have to stop it clearly. The number one best-selling book in France now is Submission, set in the future when France has a Muslim president and French women begin wearing veils. It was released, coincidentally, on the day of the Charlie Hebdo massacre. There is now a genuine fear and loathing in France that there will be more and more attacks like this because there are simply too many Muslim jihadists in the country to stop it. Dale Hurd, CBN News, Paris. When you go back to the days of de Gaulle and so forth, you realize that Algeria was a province of France and they were trying to integrate Algeria into their country. And so the Algerians had freedom to come back and forth. And, and there was even then a native uh, uh, French speaking population of Muslims. And it's grown and grown and grown and grown. And uh, there's certain areas in Paris uh, where the police can't even go. They, they belong only to these radical Muslims. And, and the police and the French can't, I mean, they have Sharia law and they, they run their own show. And the, the French government has no control over them. The so called banniers. Well, anyhow, that's, that's the way it is in France, and I appreciate Dale for his insight, but it's a cancer, again, that's going to grow and grow and grow. If it's not excised, and it won't be, then it's going to get worse. Wendy? Coming up, guitar slinger Anthony Grieve tells his family why he wants out of the band Pop Evil. I'm going to get to have a real relationship with my family, and uh, they, they didn't want that. They were livid. My father was livid that I was going to leave this band. See how a Ouija board leads to his final breakup with the band after this.
Well, you've probably heard the term hard rock, alternate, alternative metal, post-grunge. Well, there's some of the types of music that Pop Evil played. As lead guitarist Tony Grieve lived up to his rock star status until Tony, trying to get advice, consulted a Ouija board and was introduced to a demon. I'm playing these venues. I'm touring with Judas Priest. That's crazy. You know what I mean? Like getting to getting to do all this stuff. There's almost in one sense there's an emotional high about that. You're like, wow, this is the stuff that I dreamed of doing, and I'm doing it. I'm getting to live it. As guitarist for the hard rock band Pop Evil, Anthony Grieve enjoyed the success of having four top ten singles and living the life of a rock star. For me, it was an identity thing. This is who I am, I'm Tony Grieve, I'm the guitar player of Pop Evil, this is what I do. It becomes your identity, and I think that scares people. Who would you be if you weren't you? Anthony's life was consumed with music, drugs, and alcohol. But the partying wasn't enough, and he fell into a deep depression. There's an emptiness because it's not what you thought you'd be. And the bigger the band got, the emptier. It felt like you were just walking into a black hole going deeper and deeper into darkness. And there was less and less hope the further we went. And at this time, I remember crying out to God, who else are you gonna cry out to? But people began to come into my life. One of those people was a pastor who prayed with him. But Anthony says he didn't feel differently afterward. A few nights later, alone in his hotel room, Anthony had a talk with God. I said, there's nothing different but I believe in you. And I said, God, why is this still hard? I heard God speak to me so crystal clear. He said, I created you for a relationship with me. It'll never work without me. See, and this was the thing, I'd never repented. I'd never repented of my sins. For the first time in my life, I felt the Holy Ghost convicting me about my sins. And so I began to just confess my sins out to God. And as I did, I broke, I mean, something in me broke. I just, it was like I fell into his arms. Anthony decided he should leave the band. He couldn't wait to tell his family what had happened. I remember calling home and being like, listen, you guys, don't, I know you don't understand, but I met Jesus. He is real. I thought I'm going to leave all of this and I'm going to come home and I'm going to get to have a real relationship with my family. And uh, they, they didn't want that. They didn't want that. They were livid. My father was livid that I was going to leave this, 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 this band. I mean, the fame, the money that we're about to make, all this stuff. The band's about to blow up, and uh, and all of a sudden, you know, Tony changes his mind and says, "I don't want this anymore." Crushed by guilt and confusion, Anthony gave into the pressure to stay with the band. I felt trapped. What about all of our fans? You know, we have record deals. I'm signed to our managers. I literally felt like, you know what? There's no way out of this thing. So I backslid it. And uh, drinking, girls, you know, that sort of thing again. Uh, but in the back of my mind, you know, I'm like, I can't be living this way. I can't be, there's just this fight. As a young Christian, Anthony was torn between his new faith and the world that was pulling him back in. He was on a visit home when he says the Lord spoke to him again. He said, Mark 9:26. The passage was a story about Jesus casting an evil spirit out of a boy's body. I read this passage and I really freaked out because I thought the Lord was trying to tell me that I had a demon in me. You know, Anthony I'm didn't understand what was happening, but felt that something supernatural was at work. So when a friend suggested that he try consulting a Ouija board, Anthony was willing. I thought it's a piece of plastic in a board. I mean, how harmful can it be? All of a sudden it began to work and something began to feel terribly wrong. And in that moment, my brother cries out. And this thing enters his body. And it just kind of flies him back to the ground. I remember stepping back, just being terrified. Where he turned and looked at me. And I'd never experienced that much hate in all of my life to see this thing looking at me through my brother. And the Lord spoke to me and said, it's gonna be you or him. And again, he brought that scripture back to mind, 926. 926, cast out that devil boy. And all of a sudden I felt boldness hit me. And I remember I just jumped over my brother and palmed his head and I took authority over that devil. And I remember it was like that thing lost all power immediately, just 
gone. His head shot back, his eyes rolled back. I mean, he just, this thing convulsed at the name of Jesus. Anthony says that experience made his decision very clear. What became so real to me about this experience was God's word, was his word. Because scripture says, Jesus said, I've given you power and authority to cast out devils in my name. And it hit me, I thought, wow. I thought if this is real, which I just experienced, then that means everything that Jesus said is real and is true. I was either gonna choose the world or I was gonna choose God, but uh, I knew that I, you cannot have both. The two are just totally contrary to one another. And so eventually I just, I laid it all down. I left the band and just totally gave my life to God uh, just to be to completely surrendered to him and used by him. After leaving the band, he began a journey to discover God's plan for his life. That search led him to seminary, where he is preparing to go into the ministry. Anthony says that now he understands his purpose. I didn't know who I was before. Even though, yeah, I was Tony Grieve of Pop People, yeah, I had all those things. There was this emptiness of this not knowing, this unbelonging, and knowing, you know, that God is real, that God is my Father, that I have a relationship with Him. There's no greater fulfillment than that. What a story. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? The three questions that everybody needs to ask. Who am I? Tony began to ask, who am I? Who am I? Am I just a guitarist? Am I just a pop singer? Is there something more? Who am I? Did you ever stop to ask yourself, who are you? Who are you? Well, I'll tell you who you are. You are somebody that's made in the image of Almighty God. Human beings are special. They're made in God's image. And you and I are formed in the image of the invisible God, the one who created everything. And he will entrust us with eternal life if we will give ourselves to him. He wants us to be part of eternity. And eternity is so vast and it is so incredibly wonderful. But there's also another side of eternity and that's called hell. And when you run into these demonic spirits, there are demons in the world, they are real, and they are just waiting to destroy people so that they will have more company in an eternity of misery and horror. Hey, you've got a choice. Who are you? You're a child of Satan, child of God. You're a bit of protoplasm that's floating through space without any meaning, or you're somebody that has a purpose. There's something important in your life for you to do, or it's all meaningless. Which will it be? Well, I tell you what, I choose purpose and I choose God. And if you want to right now, I want you to make the choice to say, I am God's child. I'm formed in his image, I'm made in his likeness, and I want to serve him. Now, if you want that experience, I just want you to pray with me. I want you to ask him specifically to take over your life. And if you'll do it, he'll say yes. And he'll put his arm around you. It'll be the most wonderful thing you ever have experienced. So I ask you right now, bow your head wherever you are. Pray these words from your heart. Do it. Lord Jesus. That's right. Go ahead. Lord Jesus, I believe that I am made in your image. I'm created in your likeness. And my heart extends to you. And your life comes to me. So right now, I believe, Lord, that you died to take the price for all of my sin and to open the door that I might spend eternity with you in paradise. Right now, Lord, I surrender to you. I give you my life and I receive the gift of eternal life that you so freely are giving. Thank you, Lord that you have heard my prayer, and thank you that you have come in to my heart. 
Now, if you prayed with me just then, I want you to do something. I want you to tell somebody because you need to establish it. You just prayed the most important prayer of your life. I want you to pick up the phone and we make it easy for you. We've got someone on the other line who's just who's had the same experience you had, who will love you and just be so happy to hear the good news. Just call and say, I prayed with Pat. I gave my heart to the Lord. If you want to give us your name, we'll send you something that will help you. If you don't want to give us your name, that's cool, too. But you call and say, I just found the Lord. I understand my purpose in life. I am a child of God. Don't be ashamed to confess it. And I'll give you this called a new day. It will help you next thing down the road. Quickly, go to your phones and call. If the line for any reason is busy, we've got some phones here. We've got Senator of Nashville people on the phone waiting to hear your call, and they'll be thrilled. And the Bible says the angels of heaven are rejoicing because of the decision you made. 1-800-759-0700. Wendy? Thanks, Pat. Well, coming up, we're going to bring it on with your email questions. Joanne writes, should a pregnant single woman have a baby shower? Pat will answer that question and much more right after this. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Three militaries using ground troops and warplanes fought the radical Islamic group Boko Haram on at least two fronts in Africa today, with hundreds of the Islamic fighters reported dead. The battle against Boko Haram is taking on a growing international perspective with more African nations fighting against them. Well, classes are resuming at one Virginia college today after the entire campus was closed down by an outbreak of the norovirus. Hamden Sydney College had been shut down since Saturday to prevent the extremely contagious virus from spreading. The drastic step was taken after nearly 300 students contracted the stomach bug. School officials worked for days to sanitize every room on campus since the virus can remain contagious for up to two weeks. The college disinfected just about the entire campus from student housing to bathrooms in all public areas. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Just a word for Region, it's a terrific school, and the undergrad program was listed one of the top ten in the nation, as I recall, uh, by U.S. News and World Report. Am I telling that right? I think that's the top ten. One of the Ten best online bachelor's degree programs in the world. Ten best. And yeah, that's not bad. Wow. And so, uh, the same financial aids available for online as it are on campus. So it's a, you can call. The number is on your screen. You've seen it. One eight hundred two one zero 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 six zero. You said Come about uh, nine thousand students this year coming 9, in. Nine thousand this fall. Uh, We've gotten about 13,000 inquiries just during January. There's a tremendous interest in Regent these days. So wow. That's a fun place. Okay. All right. We Bring have some great on. questions. Joanne Let's... writes, what should be a Christian's response to a single person having a baby shower for an unwed mom? I thought baby showers were supposed to be for a married woman. Baby showers are for babies. <laughs> and I think if a woman is going to have a baby, that the community and her friends should stand with her and help her in every way possible. Because the other people would say, well, you ought to abort the kid and get rid of it. And that's, if you really care about life, by all means, celebrate it. And don't, we don't put the scarlet letter on people these days that get pregnant out of wedlock. So. It's not the baby's fault. The it's baby, not the baby. That's right. That, baby, that, that needs baby needs all the help <laughs> that he or she can get. And I, by all means, help those mothers. Yes. Ed writes, I'm curious. Luke 16, 26 speaks of a great gulf fix so that no one can cross over from this life, from life to death or death to life. But for years, we've heard of testimonies of those who have died and been revived. Even books, movies have been made based on true events concerning this. I'd like to hear your explanation. Uh, I, I want to correct you. I think you've misunderstood what Jesus said. He was dealing with a rich man who was in hell, who was looking up to Abraham's bosom, which was heaven. And Jesus was saying, between heaven and hell is a great Gulf fixed, and you can't go from hell to heaven and heaven to hell. That's what he was saying. Between us, there's a great gulf fixed. 
He didn't say that you couldn't come back to life again and that kind of thing. Mm. But I do people, I don't know that we've had any true resurrections, but what we have had is resuscitation. People who have been clinically dead, who have come back, uh, their body has come back. But I don't think we've had a resurrection. Now, Lazarus <clears throat> was uh, dead and decaying when Jesus called him back. Uh, but still and all, that was a rare case. But the ones we're reading about and hearing about are resuscitations. But that's what the, the Bible says. It's heaven, hell, gulf between the two. All right. Amen. All right. Well, Mary writes, Pat, I've taught my four-year-old son how to pray, and he believes God should answer our prayers immediately. And at his, at his age, he does not understand why he should have to wait. We applied for the U.S. Green Card Lottery. I tell him that we will go to America, but we are waiting for God to give us visas. Every evening, he will pray and ask God to give us visas. He also asks God to give us a car and keeps on asking me, why hasn't God given us a car? What should I tell him? Listen, uh, you tell him that he's in the will of God and God loves him. I, I love the faith of a little child. Mm. Jesus said, except your faith is like, the child, like a little child, you can't enter into heaven. That little kid is, is doing exactly what God wants him to do. He believes God, he believes the Word of God, and he expects him to do something. <laughs> well, God likes that. And uh, so you can tell him that sometimes that uh, God is, uh, you're not quite ready for him to answer your prayer. And that, that would be the idea. I mean, we're not quite ready to go to America yet, uh, but God's working it out. But other than that, I mean, you know, little children, they learn how to pray and they lay hands on the sick and the sick are healed. I mean, like now, yeah. I believe God. God likes that. He does. All right. That's so true. Well, Sarah writes, she says, hi, I would like to know how to pray appropriately for people and family that need healing. I don't want to sound like a clanging symbol to God, but I do want to pray and see results, even if the results take time. Thank you so much for even reading my question. Uh, what we don't understand is that uh, you come from the mind of God to the spirit of, of God, to the spirit of man, to the mind of man, to the mouth of man. Uh, the, it's not so much asking God to do something as listening to what He wants to do and then speaking it. You speak to the material world around you. You speak to the disease. You speak to the dead person. You speak to the sick person. And you command them. So instead of doing a lot of praying, you ask God what He wants to do and then having found it out in the name of Jesus, be healed. And that's when something happens. Speak it forth. Mm. All right. Gerald writes, I've been told that a person has to be baptized in water, full immersion, before you can be baptized with the Holy Spirit. What is your opinion? Now listen, I've done it all the way you can do it, and I think that uh, uh, there's nothing in the Bible that indicates you have to be baptized by full immersion mm -hmm. in order to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I do think, though, that uh, the baptism ceremony is, is something that often in the Bible was preceded the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But I don't see anything in there that says it's got to be by immersion, but I think that was the way that in the New Testament it was an immersion situation. It wasn't sprinkling. But um, hey, that's, I'm, I don't want to get an ecclesiastical battle, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I think there All right. are many ways. Well, thank Amen. you for some uh, great questions and great thank answers, you. Pat, All as right. always. Well, up next, sports legend Pat Williams reveals the winning secrets to success. You don't want to miss that. To see this week's most viewed stories, go to CBN.com. Well, our next guest, Pat Williams, has had a career unlike any other. He's a writer who's authored dozens of books. He's a father who's raised more than a dozen kids. Still, he's a lot like the uh, uh, larger-than-life characters of his new book. He's the general manager of the... Uh, Orlando Magic. Uh, he's been general manager of a number of sports teams. He's just a great guy, but he's just also just a person with an extraordinary character. And that's what he's written about in his new book, It's Not Who You Know, It's Who You Are. So please welcome to the 700 Club, Pat Williams. Williams has been in professional sports over 50 years. 
While most know him as an NBA executive, he actually got his start in baseball as a catcher in the minor leagues. But at 24, he moved into management, which led to his career as a general manager in the NBA that spans over four decades. Now the senior vice president of the Orlando Magic, Pat is also a best-selling author, top motivational speaker, and father of 19 children. In his latest book, It's Not Who You Know, It's Who You Are, he shares what's really important to achieving success. Well, our dear friend is with us now, Pat Williams. God bless you. It's good to see you. Pat, always good to see you. I'm always happy to come back to Regent and the 700 Club. It's a real treat. Tell me, but you had some cancer or something that uh, you, you fought it and beat it. What what would you would you have? Well, I'm in the fifth year, Pat. I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma mm. in January of 11 uh, through my yearly physical. Uh, there's the message, by the way, to your viewers. Don't neglect your yearly physical, gang. Okay. And through that, they, I was diagnosed with this form of blood cancer. Uh, so for four years now, four plus years, I've followed the regimen of the doctors, and many, many yeah. people have been praying for me, and I'm grateful for that. And uh, the last report, uh, I'm cancer-free. So I'm, Praise the Lord. I'm very, very grateful for that, Pat. Well, and you, you uh, I've learned a lot, and you sure uh, the have. Lord has doing, been doing a lot How of teaching. Books? You're the most prolific. You just never stop writing books. I mean, this is 20 or more? How That's many? number 97, Pat. Come on, 97? Yeah, yeah. Believe it or not. The first one came out in October of 1974, mm -hmm. and... Uh, so I'm kind of like, uh, I, th I kind of view it as airplanes stacked up at O'Hare. You know, when one takes off, the no, next one moves up. And, but this, this one's been fun. I, I, I've been in pro sports now for 53 years and mm -hmm. have had the opportunity to meet so many interesting people in the sports world and mm -hmm. po the political scene and the media. And, and stories, Pat, always seem to pop up. Sure. The world is not made up of atoms. It's made up of stories. Yeah. And I tell people everywhere, save your stories. Write them down. And, and, and when you have an opportunity to meet interesting people, do it. Yeah, yeah. Because you're going to come away enriched. And so this is a collection of about 150 little stories from fascinating people that I've encountered over the years. Mm -hmm. And uh, we write them and... I've had a good time doing that, including, Pat, a story about you. My goodness. Well, you, you didn't tell all the truth, did well, you? <laughs> I, Pat, here, here, here's the story. I gotta, I'm going to tell you this real quick. Okay. We, you invited me to speak at the Regent graduation up right. here some years ago. Right. We almost burned up. It was the hottest day I can ever remember. Mm -hmm. And so we finish and then come in and have lunch. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting next to you. We're drinking iced tea by the gallon just mm -hmm. to cool off. And I said to you, Pat, that 1988 presidential run, you know, wh wh why did you do that? Yeah. And you looked at me with a glint in your eye and you said, because I thought I could win. <laughs> well, that's reason. Yeah. <laughs> and that story's in the book. Okay. Well, that's the reason they get the book, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I tell, tell that story a lot, Pat. I like it. <laughs> The poor sports figures. I know you. You wrote a book about the, uh, Coach Wooden that yes. you thought was so wonderful. Who, who are the outstanding figures? Who would come out number one or two in your? Panoply? I'm a huge admirer of Tony Dungy. Yeah. Uh, the longtime NFL coach. Uh, I've written three books, Pat, about football leaders. I wrote a book called Bear Bryant on Leadership mm -hmm. and really came away awed by Coach Bryant. Then I did Bobby Bowden on Leadership, mm -hmm. another strong Christian leader. Sure. And then the other one was Tom Osborne on Leadership, the Nebraska coach, yeah, another exactly. strong Christian. Mm -hmm. Those would be three that I would point out immediately. But at this point, uh, if you're going to look to somebody, uh, you can't do a whole lot better than Coach Dungy. He's a terrific guy. Hey. His pastor, uh, uh, Ken Whitten, once said to me, mm -hmm. the tongue in Tony Dungy's mouth is always pointing in the same direction as the tongue in his shoes. <laughs> and uh, in other words, talking about his integrity yeah, and yeah. the consistency of his life. Uh, that's, that's high praise. That's high well, praise. He, he was managing the Colts when they, they got yeah. to the Super Bowl, and uh, I think uh, Peyton Manning was a quarterback for him, wasn't he? And the whole nation, I think, rejoiced. Yeah. With Tony Dungy's success. Well, he's, he's terrific. He's quite a guy. What do you quite think of this Super Bowl? This thing has gotten out of hand. It's incredibly the biggest audience in history. 
How about that, Pat? What, 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 what did we read? Um, the, the biggest single television event in, in television uh, yes. history, uh, two million more viewers than a year ago, mm -hmm. uh, and it was quite a, quite a finish. Uh, they're going to be arguing about that finish, Pat, for years. But I enjoyed it. I mean, I was glued to the it set, was as was the whole country. Hey, you have, would you have called that play? Who called it? Was it the, the offensive coordinator that called it, or was it the coach? Well, it appears the offensive coordinator called it, and he's taken a lot of heat. I, I think we were all expecting, hand it to the big guy, but, but, power it into the end exactly. zone, and let's go home. And suddenly, the, the, they're going to throw the ball. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish we could go back and... Well, it off to I, that I bet guy. the Seahawks would like to go back. But yeah. anyhow, can you imagine the money, though? Four and a half million bucks for 30 seconds spot is crazy. Yeah. yeah. Well, Pat, let's face it. We live in a sports crazy nation. Yeah. And it, and it, and it means so much to this population. Let's, mm -hmm. Whether it's college basketball and March Madness, yeah. college football, the pros. I mean, we all have our teams. We all have our rooting interest. I think... It, it makes, helps make America mm -hmm. what America is uh, because we love sports, we love good athletes, we love to admire them. And let us never forget the influence that coaches and athletes have, oh, Christian unbelievable. athletes. Unbelievable. And there's a whole world out there. We don't read about them, unfortunately. We tend to read about all the negative stuff, mm -hmm. but in a very quiet, powerful way. Uh, there's some mighty works going on through the world of sports well, for I the cause of Christ. I, I think some of the dedicated Christians on all these uh, major league uh, football teams are just amazing. I mean, yeah. they're so outspoken in their faith. They, they are, and they're yeah. not ashamed. And we see it in basketball. Our, there's a chapel service, Pat, before every NBA game, every night mm. in every arena. Incredible. So there's some wonderful things going on. Well, I'm so glad you're here. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not who you know, but it's who you are. Pat Williams, wherever books are sold, another one of his outstanding books. A great guy, and I'm so glad he's here with us. So thank you for being with us today on the 700 Club.